Hi there, uh, my name is Alexander Yukotovic and I am a postdoc at EPFLCO. In this presentation, I'm going to give an introduction to AIDA, which is a simulation manager with built-in uh, data provenance tracking. Also, I'm going to talk about AIDA Lab, uh, user-friendly interface to run simulations in a browser uh, that is based on AIDA. So since I'm already talking about simulations, let me take a step back and introduce, uh, or let's say discuss the topic of how important the simulation science has become these days. Um, this is a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in Chemistry 2013. And if you look at the press release, you'll find out an interesting statement. Simulations are so realistic that they predict the outcome of traditional experiments. Um, so if you think about this statement, um, it is something that couldn't be, couldn't be said, let's say, 30 years ago. And thanks to the development of computational techniques and um, uh, this dramatic growth of computational power, we are now at the point where computations has become an additional experiment. Um, so let's look at this um, at the development in more details. On this graph, I'm showing how the computational power has been increasing in the course of last 30 years. In the red, uh, it is shown the, the power of the most uh, of the most powerful supercomputer. In yellow, it's the least powerful uh, supercomputer in the top 500, and the blue line shows the the power combined. And uh, if you think about the speed of such a development, um, and if you transfer this analogy to the real experimental, uh, experimental lab, so the experiment that in 1989 would require one year of time, in 2018 would require only one, uh, only one second. So basically the computational power doubles every 14 months. Which brings us to the point where um, in the, if we look at the 100 most cited papers, 12, uh, 12 of those are on density functional theory. And among those 12, two are in the, in the top 10, which is pretty fascinating. So if you look in the future, uh, it's becoming pretty obvious, obvious that computational science and data uh, science together with machine learning will keep expanding and potentially, potentially will be the dominating part of the science in 21st century. Also, uh, it is a great model because the knowledge and the, the tools that we have at our disposal can be disseminated worldwide at no cost. So you cannot think of any other science that allows such a possibility to distribute the tools and the knowledge basically instantaneously. And um, the sad part about this is that uh, we don't yet have a development model for computational science. Basically, what I'm saying here is that um, in academia, there is no model to support computational science in the long perspective. As a society, we are thinking about investing uh, billions of uh, euros in, in such a facilities like synchrotron. But um, if we look from this perspective to the computational science, at most what we do is to invest money in, build, uh, in buying hardware, so building uh, supercomputing centers. Another question that I would like to ask in that respect is the following. Uh, should the science be reproducible? Well, the answer to this question appears to be obvious, of course, because this is kind of the fundamental requirement for the science to be reproducible. Otherwise, this is not a science. Uh, but what is actually, um, what has been reported in Nature 2016 that um, most scientists think, and most by most I mean 90% of scientists think, that the results that are currently published in scientific papers cannot be reproduced. For computational science, this is even more important because, in principle, we, we have no excuses to not be reproducible. As to produce the same data, the only thing we need to do, we need to have is to have the same input data and the same code to run the simulation. So we can and we must be fully reproducible. But this, in turn, requires another and poses another challenge to make open science easier. Uh, the point here is that we don't publish our data not because we don't want this. It's because this is so hard to make sense of all the, all the files that we produce when we do our research. And those are exactly the challenges that AIDA is response to. AIDA is a Python package that allows you to uh, track the data provenance. In addition to that, AIDA is a management tool. It allows you to submit simulations. So you don't submit simulation directly, but you tell AIDA to run simulation, to submit them to supercomputer and to extract data, extract the results from them. 
So the model that AIDA is based on is called ADES, Automation, Data, Environment and Sharing. So uh, as, I, as you probably un understood already, the core concept of AIDA is um, storing the data provenance, so the, the data um, column. Before you can submit any simulation, AIDA stores the input data, and once the simulation is done, AIDA will store automatically the output data. It also keeps the data provenance, so it knows which data was used as an input for the simulation and which data were produced as an output of the simulation. And all, like I said, the most relevant information is stored in a local database on the machine where AIDA is installed. But that's not only that's not the only feature of AIDA because only data provenance does not bring, um, let's say, user user friendliness to this package. So what we add in addition is the um, automation features of AIDA. Meaning that if you would like to do a simulation, you tell to AIDA to run the simulation. <clears throat> what AIDA will do, it will take your data, convert them into input files, and um, send them to the supercomputer. We'll submit to the uh, queue management, and then we'll wait until the simulation is completed. Then it will bring the data back, and we'll store the data on the local database. Also, AIDA has a capability of running high throughput simulations. It has already been tested for more than 50,000 uh, submissions per hour, which is pretty, um, which is pretty good, I would say. Also, uh, AIDA provides you a high-level environment for running more complicated simulations. Because if you think about that, um, getting a property is never one simulation, one single simulation. One typically needs to submit uh, to run a couple of uh, steps, uh, do a couple of steps. For example, if you need to get the band structure, you would first need to optimize the geometry. Then once the geometry is optimized, you can get the band structure. Also, it provides a nice environment to an analyze the data. And the last part that is not part of AIDA itself, but is added on top with a Materials Cloud platform is for, uh, for data sharing. So Materials Cloud provides a social ecosystem where you can uh, put, your data, where put your database along with the paper that you publish. And um, it provides a level of standardization because uh, what you will have to do in the end when you do a simulation, you need to convert your data that are cost specific into AIDA data that are uh, kind of standard. And uh, just a few words about the development itself. So AIDA is an open source code. It's available on GitHub under AIDA team account. And you can find this paper that was published in 2016 that basically describes the basic features of AIDA. Plus the this ADES concept that I just presented here. To move forward, I would like to give an example of a calculation that you can submit with AIDA. So this is a real submission script, uh, which is again Python. Um, you can interact AIDA, uh, with AIDA through Python interface. And um, the first thing I would like to point out here is the, is the first line, where you can specify on which machine and using which code you would like to run your simulation with. Um, basically, this is only one line where you say, I would like to run PW code at Dyn supercomputer. And if, for example, you have a PW code installed somewhere else on uh, your machine, you can just uh, change P, um, the string that defines the computer with a separate or with another one, and simulation will be some, uh, submitted elsewhere. Another thing what I would like to point out that when you submit a simulation with AIDA, you only specify the necessary inputs. So for our simulation, uh, that we do now, which is SCF. Uh, the only thing, that, that there are three things that are required. The structure, uh, the, some parameter dictionary, which says which type of calculation, in that case is SCF, and some, uh, some computational parameters, plus the uh, key points. That's all. And then you just uh, combine all these uh, inputs together, and then you submit it to, uh, to AIDA. And as I said already before, AIDA will take those input objects, we'll convert them into input files, we'll store everything in the database so you can access them later, and we'll uh, send the simulation to supercomputer and we'll wait until the computation is set up. AIDA will automatically store the input data, the output data, and the links between them. But since the calculated properties are a result of complex and connected calculations, how do we store the simulations preserving the connected structure? 
Well, we took inspiration from open provenance model for that. Here is a, an idea. Uh, we consider a population as this uh, green square, which we don't know what it's doing, but we know that it receives a couple of input nodes, which are data in one and data in two. And this calculation generates output nodes, which are out one and out two. So the only thing we know about it is that it takes inputs and returns some outputs. And that's what we do in the provenance. We store the directed link that connect data with the calculation and calculation with output data. It is important to realize that the output data can be used as input data for a subsequent calculation. And that makes the, basically the whole graph starting from the initial data through the set of subsequent calculation arriving to the final data. And this is what you get in the end. On this slide, I'm showing a pictorial representation of AIDA graph, where we have uh, some structure that is used as a starting, let's say, starting parameter that, uh, for which we do a couple of different calculations, and then we arrive to the final results through the first of all step, relaxation step, and then SCF step. And even though this picture is quite simplistic, it actually gives a pretty good understanding on what is happening in the, in the real AIDA database, in the real AIDA graph. And on the next slide, I'm going to show two examples of real data graphs. Here they are, so-called simple graphs of workloads for a single material. You can immediately see that they're not at all simple. And then uh, this brings it clear why the task of making data open and making data reproducible is so difficult. Because there are so many steps involved in different types of simulations that we do that is basically somehow impossible to reproduce of them at 100% accuracy. But this is exactly the challenge that we are trying to address with AIDA. We keep every step that has been done and we also provide a nice mechanism of data analyzing. So we have a nice uh, query builder that allows to query those databases and access the data that you want. And this brings me to the end of the second part of my presentation. I showed that AIDA is a manager for simulation that automatically stores the data provenance. AIDA automatically takes care of routine operations, such as preparing input files, sending them to a supercomputer, submitting to the queue, waiting until a simulation is done, and then retrieving the data back to, the, to your local machine where AIDA is installed. Even though AIDA was born in a material science, it had always been code and domain agnostic. agnostic. So if you prepare a plugin, you can uh, let AIDA speak to any code you're actually working with. And so, last but not least, simulations that are run through AIDA are ready for open science. All right, so now um, I'm going to talk about the last thing, the last topic of my presentation is AIDA Lab. So the motivation for AIDA Lab was the following. Um, we can do simulation with AIDA and the stores the provenance and allows us to manage all the data that we have. But how to transfer insights and expertise to somebody else? Would you still go the old way reporting data sets to experimental group through a PDF report or via email? Or would you like to give a presentation? Or would you maybe go a more direct way in order to share your data? This is um, how IDLAB started. And before I talk actually about IDLAB, I would like to talk a little bit about how we split the user base. So we envision three types of um, users. Computational scientist who knows Unix, Bash, and Python, who is able to um, use AIDA by himself without assistance, and his goals are run simulation, uh, run high throughput calculation, write complex workflows, and develop AIDA plugins. Another type of users uh, that we envision is um, experimental scientists who are not often that familiar with uh, Unix, Bash, and Python, but would like to run predefined workflows and analyze the results. And for them, IDLAB actually is a tool to go. And um, we have a third type, which is a student who has some familiarity with Unix, Bash, and Python, but would like to learn more about AIDA or IDLAB and also learn how to use Abinitio codes and would like to take materials home. So for, those, uh, for this group, we develop a tool called Quantum Mobile. So we have two things at our disposal. One is AIDA, which is a tool that, run, that can run complex workflows that stores selected data locally on the machine where AIDA is installed. 
It stores the data provenance to allow you to keep track of input data all the way to the output. And it also has Python or command line interface, which is pretty handy for computational scientists. But for the, for the non-experts in simulations, it's quite challenging to use AIDA. That's why we uh, came up with AIDA Lab, which, which, aim, uh, which has an aim of providing user-friendly interface to AIDA. It's still fully integrated with AIDA and pro keeps to all good features of AIDA, but it has user-friendly web interface through Jupyter Notebooks and widgets. It provides a possibility for an easy application development, which can be done directly in Python. It comes with handy visualization tools, and it has App Store for sharing your applications with the community. So let's assume you develop an application with AIDA Lab. It takes only a little amount of effort to put it into App Store and make it available for the whole scientific community that might be interested in your tool. So this is how AIDA Lab looks like. On the left side, you see a home page of AIDA Lab. On top, you, you see this home application, which has a file manager, which is basically a standard file manager. You can click on it and you get access to all the files you have on AIDA Lab. It has a terminal, which is a standard Linux terminal. It has task manager to control how many Task your tasks you're currently running. And if you have too many, you can just go there and close them. It provides App Store, the one that I mentioned in the previous slide, and it also has a help button. So whether you need the help, just click on this help button and you'll get some, some uh, read me some tutorials about how to use AIDLab. And um, below the home application, you see a set of installed applications. So those are not compulsory. You can delete them or you can install the ones that you want to and uh, you can also uh, change the order. And every application has a set of links that bring you to the, to the notebook that will actually do the task that uh, the application is devoted to. Also, if you look at this green text, you'll notice that uh, it's written the latest, latest version, which basically means that IDLab Lab is tracking the version of your application. So if the developer has pushed a new version onto GitHub, then um, you will get a notification here. So this text will turn into yellow and will tell you about the new update. So what you can do, you can click on Manage App and you will uh, get an interface similar, similar to what you see on the right side of the screen. You can either uninstall application through this interface or you can click on a middle button that will turn into yellow to update your application. And as I already said, it is tightly uh, connected to Git and it, can, it uses GitHub for sharing your application. So if you have an application, you just put it on GitHub, you put the link on our application store, and this app in your application will become available through IDLab interface. And now I'm going to show an example of such an application that uh, will first of all allow us to submit an isotherm calculation. And once uh, isotherm calculation is done, we can uh, browse the results because again, IDLab is connected to IDA database and will allow us to see the detailed report about this particular calculation. So I'm going to click on plane. So here I click on compute one and you'll uh, get this uh, nice interface that allows you to either select a structure from the already data, from the database uh, of IDLab, or you can select a structure from, from your local machine, from your local computer. We select the material, so we select the guest molecule, we select the temperature, we choose some parameters of the computation, and we probably put a higher pressure, so instead of 10, we put 60, so it will be computing from 0 bar till uh, 60, and we select the codes on which we're going to run these uh, calculations, and we hit submit button. So we will not wait until the simulation is done, because it will take a couple of hours, but what we're going to do, we're going to look in the database of exist existing calculations. So as you can see for methane, we have two calculations. We click on one, and then we'll be redirected to a page with more details. So again, we see the, the, the framework, and we also see the ice term, meaning that we see how the, the methane loading changes with the pressure that we apply to the system. And here, and you, you will also, if you scroll down, you'll see more detailed report about geometric properties of these materials, but those are not shown on the screen. Okay, so this is an example of an application that you can uh, that is that can be installed on Idolab. 
So let's take a real case example from Nanotech Surfaces Group from EMPA. EMPA is a material science institute that is located near Zurich, where Nanotech Surfaces is a group that is doing uh, materials research at nanoscale. So before I develop, the typical question from experimental scientists would be, uh, some while ago we discussed uh, ribbons A, B, C, did you compute the band structure for them? And some while ago can mean easily one, more than one year ago. And even though the data uh, might be there, a person who did the simulation might not even remember where they are. So the typical answer to that would be, okay, I will, I will recompute those. And another question that uh, comes up immediately, how, how much time would it take to compute such a band structure? And then, uh, after Adelab was introduced, um, the situation has changed dramatically. So here you see a real email from um, from the lead of computation, from the lead of experimental group, who writes directly to uh, experimental PhD students. So he is asking, uh, so he is already aware what simulations are available because he can access idle app account and he can see what uh, another rubens are already computed. And he is impl implicitly expecting that this will be fast. So uh, after a PhD student got this email, he immediately replied with the following email. Yes, uh, and I will do IDA DFT simulation on this ribbon and uh, to check the band structure of it. I think it will be done soon. So um, from us, from a computational scientist, it's a, it's a very good thing because we don't need to support routine operations that we do every day. Those simulations that uh, the P experimental PG student needs to do, they're quite, uh, quite typical and they're quite routine operations that um, let's say computational scientists were had to do on a daily basis just to support the experimentalist. And now uh, the effort can be shifted more towards developing of the tools, developing of the tools on IDLAB and sharing those tools with the, uh, um, with the, with the community that uses IDLAB. And bring, this brings me to the point of how difficult it is to develop uh, applications on IDLAB. So together with IDLAB, we provide some handy libraries, and one of those is IDLAB widget base that allows to uh, do common operations like uh, structure uploading, browsing, and visualization um, to be done easily with a few lines of code. So here is a real code of a structure manager widget that uh, basically can be imported from IDLAB widget base can be uh, configured this way. So if you look at the slide, we just say that I want to use structure manager widget, and I would like to uh, use the following list of importers from computer, meaning from your local machine, from COD database, from AIDA database, or from generate from smiles or take from examples. AIDA lab widget base also has a nice set of visualizers for different um, basic types of AIDA. So basically, if you uh, give give to this visualizer a uh, given AIDA type, uh, given AIDA object, it will automatically understand which visualizers to attach and will uh, display it accordingly. It also provides uh, tools to select code in computer where you run simula uh, your simulations. It allows you to, it provides nice tools to follow the uh, word chain process execution and also uh, it allows you to see, uh, like, uh, to see the output updated on the fly. So all these, again, all these tools are open source and available for free for everybody for the for the usage. And this brings me to the conclusion of this uh, of the third part of my presentation. So um, I I showed you IDLAB, and uh, IDLAB is already open to the world, so you can check it out on the work section of Materials Cloud. We are now working on adding application dependency, dependency management. So <clears throat> if you install an IDLAP application from the App Store, you will only get the set of notebooks. It's quite important and uh, needed now to also provide a way to install some additional Python packages. This is still not implemented, but we are working on it and it will be available soon. We are now in phase where we focus on stabilizing the code and writing documentation rather than adding new features, unless it is critical. And we are looking for new application contributors. If you'd like to be the one, uh, please drop us a line and we are happy to help you in such a development. And I would like to point out here again that uh, like AIDA, AIDA Lab was, not, was born in a material science 
but it is not focused only in material science. In principle, you can do any type of simulations, provided that uh, AIDA plugin is available for this kind of code. If you come from different fields, um, the first step to do for you would be to write an AIDA plugin and to, uh, to allow AIDA speak to your code. And then once it is done, you can quite easily write an AIDA lab application so that uh, experimental groups who want to use your tools can just uh, can do it by a few clicks, which is pretty nice. And this is the end of my presentation. I would like to leave uh, the last slide where you see some um, maybe interesting links. So if you're interested about AIDA, uh, please visit our website uh, www.aida.net. We have um, a nice set of documentation for AIDA itself and for um, related packages. And also, uh, please uh, come to CI Materials Cloud. Uh, it's a place where we share the, some educational material. We also share um, some already published AIDA databases. And we also provide a place where you can upload uh, your archives uh, along with the papers that you publish. AIDA Lab is, can also be found on Materials Cloud in the work section. And um, if you would like to uh, install uh, AIDA Lab on your machine, you can do that. Or you can uh, download the Quantum Mobile Virtual Image that already has everything pre-installed. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. I would like to thank you all for your kind attention.